from Relay FM. This is Upgrade, episode 479. It is October 2nd, 2023. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace and Uni Pizza Ovens. My name is Mike Hurley. I'm joined by Jason Snell. Hi, Jason. It is me. I just like that pause. It makes me wonder, like, what is this upgrade? Is this something else? We don't know. It's drama. I love it. It's good to be here. The introductions, they just, you know, they come into me on the fly. Like, I don't really know what is going to happen next, you know? And that was it. I took a pause. We're into October already. I think that was what actually made me pause. I kind of can't believe that we're in the fourth quarter of this year. It's, yeah, it is surprising. And also, September has like 60 days in it, right? Is September's that how that not works? over around these parts. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's September true. begins at the end of August and ends at the beginning of October. Mm. That's September. I have a Snell Talk question for you. It comes from Mark. Mark asks, Jason, do you decorate your home for Halloween? If you do, when do you put up and take down these decorations? I uh, don't. Okay. Halloween, um, not my favorite, honestly. Mm. Not my favorite. Mm-hmm. I do have, though, there's one decoration that I do have. Okay. I have the, um, I have a tube man, you know, uh, one of those air dancer tube mm-hmm. men, and he's orange. The wacky inflatable um, flailing tube. Yeah, he, he tells you to, you know, look over here. And I, I'm sure I've talked about this before. Like, I think I bought it from a company called, like, lookatme.com. It's literally. Look over here, something like that. Um, and he is my Halloween decoration. So on Halloween or whenever the trick-or-treaters are out, because we live in an... I, I grew up out in the middle of nowhere. We didn't have trick-or-treaters. We didn't do trick-or-treating. It was just not a thing. And now I live in the prime neighborhood where everybody in my town comes for trick-or-treating. And we have to buy huge bags of it. And I hate it. I hate it. Sorry, people who love Halloween. I hate it. I don't want the people to come to the door. I, I, I really would like to be one of those people who like turns off all the lights but and hides, but y- you just can't. So instead we do it, and I'm also married to somebody who doesn't want to do that. So um, but but my what I do is uh, I put out my tube man. I put him out um, sometimes on the roof, sometimes on the front lawn or the front, it's not a lawn anymore, the front uh, uh, native plants uh garden and uh you know what the tube man delights the children delights the children of course it does they love the tube man and so that's my contribution to halloween uh as well as paying for bags of crappy cheap candy that we give away to kids uh my 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 contribution is the tube man he he brings happiness to all and i also have a santa tube man uh, and and because uh, you get a little blower, and then you can get little these little sort of silk uh, tube men separately. They're like uh, it's a whole ecosystem of tube men. Mm-hmm. And uh, tube so man for Christmas, I put yes, yeah, it is, it is. What a service that is too. We salute you, tube man. Uh, thank you for your service. So, um, uh, Santa. Anyway, Santa goes up around Christmas uh, and I do tube Santa for a little bit, but the primary objective of tube man, actually the primary objective of having a tube man is that my daughter and I always talked about wanting a tube man and I finally bought one. But the, the, you know, after that it was, won't he be great for Halloween? And it turns out he is great for Halloween. And all the seasons, apparently. You get I have Easter thought bunny. about, <laughs> I, I, honestly, Mike, uh, there is like an uncle Sam tube man that I'm thinking of buying for the 4th oh, of July. You've got to. You've right, got to. That would be hilarious. <laughs> right? Tube so, Man wants you. <laughs> yeah, to celebrate the 4th of July with fireworks or whatever, but not around me because you might burn me down. Uh, so, yeah, I love yeah. Uh, I love my Tube Man. That's what I'm saying. Who wouldn't? And I love Snow Talk questions because of yes. that. If you would like to send in a question of your own for us to open a future episode of Upgrade, go to UpgradeFeedback.com. So we mentioned that September continues. So this is the final call for Relay FM for St. Jude. Go to stjude.org slash relay. Our campaign is ending officially on Friday, October 6th. So that's the final day of the campaign. We have currently raised, as of recording right now, Drum roll. $742,000, which is truly incredible. We have obliterated 
our previous goal, which was seven hundred and six thousand dollars, like our previous top amount raised, like a record is the word I'm looking for. Uh, that was set last year, was seven hundred and six thousand. So we have smashed through that. I cannot believe what our community has done this year. Um, it is truly incredible. We are like staring down three million lifetime at this mm-hmm. point. It's like fifty thousand dollars away. So difficult, but not impossible by the end of the week. So what I would say right now is if you have yet to donate, now is an incredible time to do so. Go to stjude.org slash relay and you can help support the life-saving work of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. One of the most important parts of being a patient at St. Jude is having the space to not just be a patient, but to be a kid. This year, St. Jude opened the Family Commons, a 45,000-square-foot space just for families. It is a treatment and clinical staff-free floor of the hospital, a place for families to rest and reconnect between their appointments. This space came about after feedback from parents of St. Jude who were looking for a space on campus where families could get downtime together between their clinical appointments to have a sense of normalcy. This is like the whole thing at St. Jude. It's more than a hospital. It's more than a research center. It's all of those things and more than all of that. And that is why I believe we can help get them to their life-saving work, their goal, which is to make sure that no child dies from cancer. That is St. Jude's goal. And with the donations from listeners like you, we get one step closer to that day, one cure closer, one child closer. The longer we do this, the more and more life-saving work that will be done for the kids of St. Jude. It's why we continue to come back year after year and ask you, our listeners, to help. So please go to stjude.org slash relay. You can donate. You can find out more there. So I'm also going to take this as an opportunity to mention the things that you could otherwise be missing out on if you have not yet made a donation. If you make an individual gift of $60 or more, you will receive in a few weeks' time, a digital bundle of Relay FM wallpapers and an incredible Mac OS screensaver with tons of great art put together by James Thompson in collaboration with our friend Jelly as well, put together all the art for us this year. Um, Donors who make an individual gift of $100 or more get all of that and a sticker pack featuring a bunch of designs themed around the campaign. If you want to set up a fundraiser of your own, you still have time to do this, where you could set up a fundraiser, you could send it, share it with your friends, with your colleagues, with your community. Fundraisers who raise at least $1 receive a challenge coin of the campaign. I actually have one. We have them at the podcast. With them. They're awesome. If you raise $250 or more, you will receive an incredible desk mat. Now, you can just make a donation to a campaign that you set up for yourself if you want to. The top 50 fundraisers at the end of the campaign will also receive a limited edition Relay FM for St. Jude tote bag, which is super cool. Please go to stjude.org slash Relay to donate and find out more. If you do make a donation of your own, please click the blue Search Employer button on the donation summary page. You can check if your employer offers a matching gift program. If you've done this and you haven't heard back about it, please check your email because you get an email with details for how to get things credited to our campaign total. I know there's a lot of information here, but I really want to make sure that we get all of this to you before the campaign ends. This is the last time that we'll be talking about it for this year. Please go to stjude.org slash relay. St. Jude won't stop until no child dies from cancer. And with your support, we'll be one step closer to that day, one cure closer, one child closer, this month and every month. Let's cure childhood cancer together. And now it's October. Yeah, I guess for us it is October now. (laughs) I guess Mm -hmm. that's how that works. Turn the page. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have like a... (laughs) A funny thing that's happened mm-hmm. um, <laughs> due to a shipping error from a shipping company. Uh, a selection of international parcels of our Summer of Fun <laughs> merchandise went missing, including yeah, if mine. Qu- <laughs> if I could quote, if I could quote, uh, I'll, I'll erase some of the details. But if I could quote from our, our contact in the Cotton Bureau, mm-hmm. um, after invest investigating carriers. Uh, or carrier it eventually advised us that they have officially lost 15 packages, including one that was supposed to go to Mike. Mm-hmm. They have no idea where they are. Mm-hmm. If we ever get them back, it won't be soon. Uh, this is exceptionally rare, and they told us they identified the issue and fixed it. Now, when this came up in one of our uh, 
one of our uh, discords, I think somebody suggested like, okay, who's dri- you know what dri- the driver that like drove their truck off a ledge or off a cliff or something like that oh, has no. been has been uh, relieved of their duties oh, <laughs> or wow. left the truck somewhere and came back to find it overturned, empty, and on fire, has been let go. Well, I, like I don't what know Zach what he's they... proposed in Discord, that it is a summer of fun heist that somebody has uh, really yeah, I like it. this much. I like it. The big, big heist. Anyway, yeah. Carrier says, you're not getting it. <laughs> or yeah. if you are getting it, it will be a very long time from now. So What I'm happy <laughs> about, though, is that they have said that the Carrier did realize it was their problem and they fixed the problem. Mm-hmm. Like, that makes me happy right at least yeah we fi- we fixed it this this particular problem will never happen again yes. again that's because jerry has been let go so i but, guess if uh, you live yeah. overseas and from this point on ever receive a parcel from cotton bureau with your merchandise in it you can thank the upgradians for having solved this for you you know i guess so I to guess make sure the problem. that everyone, including me, gets the Summer of Fun shirts that they <laughs> ordered, we've reopened the campaigns of some of this stuff. Amazing. So what this allows us to, just with the way that, that things work at Cotton Bureau, is an easy way to put it through. But it also means if you missed out on a wonderful summer t-shirt, you have another chance. And we've also used this as an opportunity to bring back the ever-excellent Upgrade hoodie, which has a wonderful embroidered patch and a secret Upgradian seal screen print on the inside. Mm-hmm. So these are all on sale for the next two weeks at UpgradeYourWardrobe.com. Uh, these are also joining our ever-present excellent selection of on-demand t-shirts that you can go and check out at any time over at UpgradeYourWardrobe.com. So yeah, this is the, ho- the hoodie, mm-hmm. I beseech you, This is the hoodie doesn't go on sale that often. Mm-mm. It is uh, here in the Northern Hemisphere getting toward the cooler months. The hoodie is back, and it does have the special... Uh, secret screen print on the inside on top of everything else. The, I'm wearing my Thunderbolt Doc shirt right now, Mike, which oh. you don't have. I don't have one of those. I'm wearing Cause. my Room Around Up t-shirt. <laughs> ah, but, that's nice. Which people can buy at any time. I look forward anytime. to joining you in mm. time for Christmas. <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> I did wear this on the podcastathon, so you got to see it, and that was that moment where, because we knew about this already, where you said, oh, so that's what that t-shirt looks like. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> I had been paying attention. I had been like, yep. I sent an email to Compre. I was like, did this? What happened to this? And that, yeah. I think that was one of the things they, they heard from a couple of people. They started their uh, uh, investigations, and now it has opened up one more opportunity for you to buy this merchandise if you would like. Yeah, yeah. This happened on the Incomparable too, by the way. Yes. So the uh, we we had a bunch of <laughs> Incomparable shirts that also mm-hmm. never reached their destination. So yeah, it's great. I have quite a lot of follow up today. That I would it like to it talk to feels about. like we always have this episode, right? Where mm-hmm. um, after all of the things that have been going on, we suddenly end up with just a huge amount of footnotes and follow up. So here we are. First, I actually would just like to ask you a question. Have you made a decision about your personal iPhone? I haven't made a final decision yet. Mm-hmm. It's in, it's still in the box that it was shipped in. Mm-hmm. But I haven't done a transfer because I've got I, I still haven't by the way, I still haven't has Jason made an iPhone review question mark? The answer, no, I haven't. I'm still thinking about it. Okay. I think this week. Okay. I'm still thinking about it. Well, I mean, what do I say now? It's been all this time, right? Because I get it after I got it during the podcast a thon. Everybody got their iPhones. So I, I have to think about it. It's gonna be more like, you know, an essay about an iPhone fifteen is what it'll be. So I haven't done that. So I'm still using all the review units. I went to the uh Cal football game this weekend, took a bunch of shots with the five X camera. Oh, whoa, that five X camera on the Pro Max. It's, it's really real cool, nice. Right? Yeah. Um right now I'm leaning toward actually keeping the phone I ordered, a fifteen pro in midnight blue. Um, because I do like the midnight blue. I also like the natural. Mm-hmm. Um in in holding the Pro Max as much as I love that 5x, I don't I don't want a phone okay. that big. I just don't. I, I I could use it, and in fact I I've tried to. So we talked about this when we were in Memphis. Um, I've tried to um narrow in to why I I said it's not that bad, and of course then you devil on my shoulder were like it's in fact it's good, Jason. It's good. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the fact that I run and walk the dog and all those things with the Apple Watch has made my concerns about iPhone size a lot less relevant to me, right? Because one of my reasons for getting a for getting a mini and wanting the smaller phone is that I hate going out and having the iPhone in my pocket and it's, you know, 
swishing around in there or it's it, like it's it's just I don't like having that iPhone weight in my pocket when I'm just walking around in the neighborhood and that's gone, right? The only time I bring the iPhone with me now is when I'm like I put on the, the big boy pants and I like go somewhere, right? I I don't if I'm just walking the dog, I I don't bother. Um and that that means size is less of a concern because uh, in those places where I really need to not be burdened, I am totally unburdened now because I just use the Apple Watch. So I think that's the reason behind it. But having carried it around for the review and taken the shots, the beautiful shots of that 5X camera, I don't think it's for me. I think it's I think it's just too big. I, I think I'm my hands don't fit on it very well. Um, and you know, I, I think it's a bridge too far, but I, I will admit to being tempted by it. And I will admit that that five X, mm. uh, camera is spectacular. So I think what's really happening is if I'm any indication, a lot of people are going to be more tempted. And that's probably the, my guess is the percentage is going to shift a little bit toward the pro max this year. Um, and I, I hope that next year, the smaller phone gets that higher zoom because that would be amazing. But that, that's sort of where I am right now. But I've got a little time to decide. I'm I'm going to wait until my iPhone review is over before making a final decision. Last week on the show, you mentioned that the international orange on my Apple Watch could be held up to the Golden Gate Bridge, which is also painted mm-hmm. international orange. Friend of the show, Ian, wrote in to say, fun fact, international orange is not just one color but rather three. So we should start calling it international oranges. Yes. Clearly. There is aerospace, Golden Mm. Gate Bridge, and Mm. engineering. Golden Gate Bridge. (laughs) The the three genders. (laughs) (laughs) Aerospace, Golden Gate Bridge, and engineering. They're not even, they're not even match. That's so weird. That's like, that's like, uh, I'm going to provide you with three options. There's Mm -hmm. running, Mm -hmm. fish, (laughs) <laughs> and John, <laughs> what? Makes what? It worse? What? So the link is in the show notes to the Wikipedia page. Yeah, is that they are all just called International Orange. International Orange, and then in brackets, either Aerospace, Golden Gate Bridge, or Engineering. To me, this reads without doing any research about this. To me, this reads as like they wanted to paint the Golden Gate Bridge International Orange and messed up, and then just then created no, like their own color. I, Actually, well, without knowing anything about it, I'm going to invent a narrative here, which is I wonder if the Golden Gate Bridge was painted international orange. And then they said, mm, we need some other international oranges that aren't that color. And so they expanded it. But the Golden Gate Bridge is so synonymous with international orange that they said, OK, that's that one. Yes, mm-hmm. that is international orange. But we need an engineering one and an aerospace one, so we've added those two. We need to lighten it up a little bit for airplanes or whatever. Well, you say um, that, but I've got to continue, and it's going to unfortunately prove that wrong, I think. So Golden Gate Bridge is slightly no. more red. This carries on from Ian. More red than what people often picture when they think of international orange. Engineering is the most red. It was specified in 1956. but right, first so used after the Golden Gate Bridge. During World War II to precisely describe a high-visibility color to the growing list of military equipment contractors most often seen on today's radio masts. Wait, when was the Golden Gate Bridge built? 1939. Is that after World War II? No. Okay. <laughs> well, who knows? The history of International Orange will remain a mystery, but there are three right. colors. Okay. Now, which one? Here's the, the kicker, Mike. Mm-hmm. Which one is the button on the side of the Apple Watch Ultra? I think it's more close to International Orange Aerospace, but I'll have to wait uh, until I go and uh, go and look at it. Okay. I'm looking at my, I'm looking at Wikipedia, looking at the Wikipedia entry, and looking at the button on the watch. You know what? Maybe it is a fourth International Orange, and it's Apple Watch. You know <laughs> why not? Why not? Okay. We'll we'll just look, Mike. The important thing here is that there'll be more follow-up on this. Most definitely. I mean, it's already starting about people being upset about me not knowing the exact dates of World War II. You know? 
Yeah. Also, it's confusing because it was, it was specified in 56, but they started using it in World War II. So that's another example where they picked a color mm -hmm. and then later they said, yeah, 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 that's international orange. It's not, it's red. But mm -hmm. uh, sure, we'll call that international orange too after the fact. Um, so that's, yeah, exactly. So we spoke for a long, many episodes uh, quite a while ago about you trying to get a, a smart lock for your home that had home key support mm -hmm. and you settled on the schlag 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 lock let's say schlag and uh, i just i saw something on mac rumors that yale has debuted two new smart locks yeah that feature and i saw some people okay. in the six colors uh, member discord talked about this too who took who got them mm -hmm. um it is so i've got the yeah i've got the schlag lock and um, and that's how they pronounce it, even though as a, a German student, I, I really want to call it Schlager, but it's not a Schlag because it's mm -hmm. Americans. Um, Yale is what I had before. Um, yep. What I like about the Yale locks is that they're almost featureless. They're like these little dark kind of portals <laughs> yeah. and they're flat and they sit on the door and then you can either touch them and put in a, a number pad code the number pad lights up or you can hold your watch or phone up to the lock in this case now and they auto unlock that based on the nfc chip and and that's how home key works great um the 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 schlage lock that i've got i don't like it quite as much it's kind of got like a frame around it and then the the keypad is sort of indented yeah. it's got a um and then depending on your feelings it's got a, a keyhole it's got a, like a lock um and you can use a physical lock or physical key with it to turn the lock um, which Lauren was telling me she likes that because there's this sort of like backup of like you could just use the key if you want to. And she likes that. Um, I, I, It's fine. I mean, my thought is it also means that it's easier to pick the lock. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, really, at that point, somebody's going to break into your house. This year do it. one, there is a key option. Like, so you can you can have it key yeah. or key free. Yeah, and the key free, I think they have like a little contacts for like a uh, a battery. A mental battery. Yeah, so you can wake it up and you put can jumpstart your, your lock if you need to. Essentially, <laughs> it's weird. so. Anyway, it's it's nice, and in fact, I might prefer this design. And if I didn't already have one, I might buy this one. Yeah. However, and Yale's not going to like me saying this, but it's just I have to call it like it is. My door doesn't fit exactly right. It's not immaculate. It's a little bit off. And that means that sometimes, depending on how the door has set when it's closed by a person, um, the, the, the bolt comes out and it strikes the strike plate a little bit. And it has to kind of like push and move, essentially move the door a very small amount in order to get it all the way through. So there's a little ex sometimes a little extra force that's required. And in my experience, the Yale, the last generation Yale smart lock, did, was the motor was not very strong and it would often fail and it was not great and I, I did a lot of rejiggering to my door to try to get it to work better but the fact was that there were certain times when it would fail and that and then beep loudly and it was not great hmm. I have not had a failure like that with the Schleich lock it has a much stronger motor it did have a physical failure in the in part of the bolt housing, and I called them, and they said, "Oh, uh, sorry, that does happen sometimes with our locks, and we are sending one to you free right now." Okay. And I replaced it, and it it has worked great. But what I will say, so good customer service there. It was a failure, but good customer service. So that's my only other takeaway is like ultimately leaving aside the design and the implementation and I really like home key locks. I think they're really nice. I have gotten used to touching my Apple Watch up to up to the door. I think it's great. Um, but my experience has been that the Schlage locks have a stronger motor and that matters to me because it means that they're more likely to succeed. Whereas the Yale lock was just weak enough that sometimes it would try to close the lock and fail <laughs> and be like, I can't do it. Beep, beep. And that's not a great feature in a that's lock. That's not so good. So, no. Not so great. That's not so helpful. Uh, Tim Cook has been talking about the Vision Pro a, bit, a bunch over the last couple of weeks. He's been doing lots of media because of the iPhone and other reasons that I'll get to in a minute. But he's been talking a lot about the Vision Pro, it seems like, wherever he can. And there's a couple of things that I thought were 
interesting or just funny to me. So uh, Tim Hardwick at Mac Rumors was reporting on a CBS interview. So Tim Cook told CBS Sunday Morning that he watched the entire third season of Ted Lasso on his Vision Pro. Which just seems like a mm-hmm. funny thing. Like, that's just yeah. very funny to me. It's like an unnecessary flex. Like, the entire season? Well, there was like one episode you didn't watch on an iPad, Tim? Nope. You know? And also, I just love the double promo in, in one sentence. Yeah, yeah, you know? sure. Like, he, he didn't watch just a show. He only watched the third season of, of Apple's favorite Ted Lasso. Yes. I'm surprised he didn't also watch the debut premiere of The Morning Show, you know, on it as well. Mm. Uh, and Tim also said to CBS Sunday Morning that it's still on track for launching, quote, early next year, whatever that means. Mm-hmm. And uh, also talking to David Thielen at The Independent, Tim Cook, this is a quote, Tim Cook says Vision Pro has become part of his nightly routine, helping him understand how it could become an industry-defining product. There are hu- Tim says there are huge differences in how people look at it, depending on if they read about it or if they've actually tried it, he says. I believe even more about how profound spatial computing is. When you've tried it, it's an aha moment, and you only have a few of those in a lifetime. Now, I no, agree I- with that second part. I think we, we both do. The thing that annoys me about this quote is, why did he not ask him about the nightly routine? What does that mean? What does yeah. that mean? I, I saw uh, somebody, a commentator, I think maybe it was Nick here, um, who said, well, while it's interesting to say if you've tried it, you you know, it is also worth pointing out that the only people who've tried it are people Apple allowed to try it. That is <laughs> funny. It's like, yes. okay, it is true. Yeah. That is, just keep yeah. in mind yeah. that it's a very specific group. But but I do think, and you and I both had this experience, it it certainly makes more of an impact to actually experience it. And, and it's very hard to convey that if you're just... Uh, trying to imagine that based on what other people have said. That that said, we were also in a uh, incredibly constrained demo of mm-hmm. it, and that's not quite the same as going through a nightly routine. Uh, what I Whatever what I take away means. from this is, um, I don't look. I think Tim Cook dog foods a bunch of stuff, right? I I really do. I think he, he uses new iPads. I think he uses. I think he wants to be. Even at the CEO level, he wants to be familiar with and understand the products that Apple's making so that he can talk about it, but also that he he stays connected to the products. It's a product company. It really, I mean, and services and software, but like it matters. And so I like that he seems to be really engaged with this product because he should be. It's and, and he isn't always as engaged with products, right? He we that's the sense we get is he's an operations guy, he's the CEO, he's got other people to do this, he's not Steve Jobs. But in this product, I suspect like the Apple Watch, it is more important to him and he's spending more time with it. And I like that, right? Because he doesn't necessarily have to do this, but I think it's a good thing. And I would imagine that Tim Cook using Vision Pro every day probably has helped the progress of that product development right yeah. that 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 tim cook is using it and seeing where it works and seeing where it doesn't and if he's in a meeting he can be like i don't know i tried that and this happened and like that's a much more informed perspective from the ceo i think it's good yeah. but yes i do wonder is it like is he brushing his teeth and augmented reality while ted lasso plays in the corner yeah. or like i i don't know is he like, getting there are like many questions his nightly cream all over the lens by accident like what's happening <laughs> is, over there is this is this where he drinks his smoothie while he's uh hanging in back in an armchair watching uh I, an Auburn uh, football game projected on uh, on the wall. I don't know. I tell us more, Tim. Tell us more about uh, Tim Cook after dark with the Vision Pro. Well, Jason, someone might have gotten this out of him because old boys our friend been busy. So you may remember last year around this time, Tim took a tour of Europe, and hey, he's been on it again. Oh, so we're back on the Upgrade Podcast with your annual recap of the tour of Tim Cook. As it is to this date. So, where in the world is Tim Cook? Well, I'm going to let uh, you know. I'm working on it. All right. Okay. He started by attending a photo gallery show of images taken on iPhones in New York. He then went across the Atlantic to attend a Real Madrid training session and later a match, obviously, in Spain. 
He yes. had a dinner with a chef who, quote, uses the iPhone 15 Pro Max in their creative process, and another mm. who is champion, championing sustainability. We're still in Spain, by the way. He then attended a musical performance at an Apple store in Madrid. He visited okay. a school that uses iPhones for photography in their classes. Mm -hmm. He then visited the Procreate developers. Nice. Part of his tour. I didn't know they were in Spain. I'm not sure where they are, actually. I didn't write that part down. Oh, okay. This is still part of the Spanish leg, so I'm assuming that they're in Spain. Because in or near Spain, I'm about sure. to tell you something else that I know he did in Spain. So I'm assuming that they're still in Spain. So uh, He then spent time with a Spanish Paralympic swimmer who was wearing an Apple Watch, and they made a video about it. Tim then leaves Spain to meet with chip company NXP, who supplies parts to Apple. Um, he used this as an opportunity to highlight the sustainability work on decarbonizing. Quote, Tim says, NXP's chips are in many of our products, including our new carbon neutral Apple Watch lineup. So I will pause here for a moment because now it feels like genuinely we, there's just a pattern for this. Because last mm -hmm. time when he did this, he was in Japan, I think, with Sony and said similarly, uh, yes. we have used Sony's p chips forever. And it's like, Apple never talk about this, but now they've done it two times in two years on a Tim tour that he goes to somewhere and calls them out specifically as like mm -hmm. a great partner. And it's like, they never, ever, ever talk about this stuff otherwise. So I just find that very interesting. This just in Procreate is uh, apparently in Tasmania, <laughs> which is as bad as far away from Spain as you can get. Uh, I think it's literally like the other side of the globe from that. But there, maybe there were some, maybe there's a little Procreate team Procreate in Spain. Procreate so huge. But like, here's the thing. This, if I followed this chronologically, as I assume that is it, right? He he was still on this in the Spain leg when he was meeting Procreate. Okay. You know? All right. Okay. He didn't, unless he burrowed using new Apple technology we don't know about, burrowed straight through the core of the earth and emerged in Tasmania. Who knows? Maybe he did. Maybe he had a digital persona. I don't know. I think uh, the I recall from my trip to New Zealand that Spain is actually on the exact opposite the antipode of uh, New Zealand. So it's in the ballpark of Tasmania. It's not that far off. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying ask the mole people the truth about Apple's lava burrowing. Anyway, they, they were probably in Spain. <laughs> they were probably think, in Spain. Probably in Spain. Spain. Yeah. Tim then met with developers in the Netherlands who make various uh, like a game studio and a cycling app. Obviously, it's in the Netherlands. Mm, he also sure. spent time with a Dutch YouTuber. Great. Uh, Love it. Tim then listened, went over to listen to some spatial audio music at a studio in Copenhagen. <laughs> of course he did. He then, and this is another thing that happened uh, last time, a, a, another random Apple executive appears. And Tim visited a solar farm in Denmark with Lisa Jackson. Uh, I love this. I, so in my mind, it's like, so Tim's off all over the place. And then like someone else has to go, you know, like because yeah. we had Eddie Q uh, Eddie, at, at last time. Uh, yeah. are, at, at Oktoberfest. Yeah. Are we sure? I was about to say, are we sure that that there isn't a thing we've missed here where Tim and Eddie had like tapas? Not yet. Somewhere. Not yet. It, I, look, I don't know that the tour's over. Okay. Because we cap it off now with Tim coming to the great country of the United Kingdom. Because Eddie loves those small plates. Just loves the small, you just sure get the, a whole bunch of little small plates and it's like the tapas and it's great. So I'm sure he was like, Tim, Tim, I'm going to order for you. It's going to mm -hmm. be great. That's in my mind. That's my imagination. They went to the UK, you say. Yep. Here in the UK, he spent some time with some British developers. Uh, he spent some time with some school children, which I thought was adorable, and then met with the prince and princess of Wales to talk about the environment. And in the images, it was something that like, I realize I've, I've not seen a lot of, which is Tim cooking a soup. Uh, I feel like we don't see royals. Tim in a soup very much. And I will say, I appreciated that you wore a suit. To visit the, uh, the, 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 the prince of Wales? Yeah. So that, that's how far we've gotten so far. He's not wearing a tie, but to be fair, William also not wearing a tie. Yeah, it's like, you know, they're like, it's like dressing up, but like we're not going to, you know, we're cool, you know? That's, that's, that's the note that I get there. Yeah. Did he go to Battersea? I assume he did. Well, as a part of, I move on now to my oh, final piece oh. of follow-up for you today. As part of Tim's press tour, the Evening Standard has published some interior photos of Apple's mm. Battersea campus, which I believe is the first time this has happened. And so Mike Hurley gets to tell you, yes, this is what I saw. And it's stunning in there. Unbelievable. It is 
beautiful. And you can it looks kind of like Apple Park in a way too, right? Yep. Where there's the like an atrium, and then yep. there are the the various levels, and it's all kind of open air. It's all soft and round, right? But it's brick rather yeah. than uh, I think brick. it's like. I don't know what stone it is. It looks like limestone to me, but I don't it's think it is. It's magical Italian stone quarried yeah. from a very particular place in, in Italy, only known by Johnny Ive. But And so you to get to say there, if you look, if you like go down the page, you've got the image, which is like the, the large image, which shows like the archways. Like and they have these huge brick archways, which is like the the atrium area. This is oh, when yeah. I, I went there and I was with uh, one of the architects and I pointed up at the corners and said that's incredible how do you do that and he said to me it's not real and i don't really know what that means but it was a beautiful <laughs> detail and i guess you can take from that what you want because i've never mm. seen brick curve like that and i guess it turns out it isn't and but i don't really it, know uh, what that means i don't really know what that means it's a it's a piece well i was we had this conversation a long ago about like the ballpark in san francisco has the brick and why there isn't brick in san francisco because it crumbles and it's very bad in earthquakes and so you end up having the the ballpark in san francisco has a brick front because it wants to feel old timey but it's literally there's a picture that when they were building it in the san francisco chronicle of the the little brick wall uh yeah veneer being placed on it right it's not it's not real it's not a brick building. It's a concrete building, reinforced concrete with a brick kind of overlay. And it wouldn't surprise me if that's what they did here is there's the real brick of the Battersea Power Station. And then there's the mm, architectural brick molding I reckon that goes in certain places. I reckon it's brick up to a point. And then yeah, it's not real right. brick. And then it, trans- That's, like it it seamlessly goes back to brick again. They they want to mix it in because it has to fit in with the rest of the building. Yeah, yeah that's It is what I truly too. breathtaking in there. Like... And I'm just happy that they've released some images now because, like, wow, it's a facade. It's quite, it's David Shaw reminds me the right word is not veneer; it is facade or cladding. Emma says, "Sure." Uh, anyway, sometimes it's uh, brick all the way through. Sometimes it's not. That's okay. Or maybe it's not brick at all, Mike. Oh, <gasps> okay. This episode is brought to you by. Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to let you build your brand and grow your business online. You can stand out from the crowd of a beautiful website, engage directly with your audience and sell your products, services, or the content you create. Squarespace has got everything you need all in one place. You can do all of those things, one of those things, two of those things, or more. It doesn't matter. They have all of the tools that you're going to need to make exactly the kind of website that you want to make. You can Get started with a best-in-class website template. Customize every single design detail to your heart's content with a reimagined drag-and-drop technology that Squarespace has built. It's called Fluid Engine. It is their next-generation website design system to allow you to unlock your creativity more easily than ever before. This is on both desktop and mobile. It works. So you can design your website wherever you want. You can stretch your imagination with Fluid Engine. It is built in and ready to go on any new Squarespace site. You can very easily get a blog set up if you want to do that. And they have these wonderful tools to allow you to, uh, they have a thing called their asset library where you can upload, organize, and access your content all from one place. They have the ability to, to, you know, you can post articles, you can have them scheduled. They've got all of those tools built in. It's super simple. If you want to sell uh, physical or digital goods, they have all of the tools that you need to start selling online. But you can also go that one step further. If you want to encourage your visitors to sign up as email subscribers, you can start them on a journey to becoming loyal customers with Squarespace email campaigns. You'll be able to stand out in any inbox. You just get started with an email template. You customize it again with your brand ingredients like your site colors, your logo, so it all feels cohesive. And they have built-in analytics to measure the impact of every send. Just the same way that they have analytics to help you understand where your visitors and sales are coming from on your website. Super cool. I've used Squarespace for over 15 years at this point. When I want to put something online, I just want to get something online. Squarespace is the easiest and most beautiful way to do it. Go to squarespace.com slash upgrade and you can sign up for a free trial and build your website today. Then when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash upgrade and use the code upgrade at checkout to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That is squarespace.com slash upgrade and the code upgrade when you decide to sign up to get 10% off your first purchase and show your support for the show. Our thanks to Squarespace for their support of this show and all of Relay FM. It is time for a rumor roundup, Jason Snell. Yeehaw! So I've got quite a few things from Ming-Chi Kuo today. He's been publishing some reports. Uh, the first 
is about Quo's expectations for the Vision Pro based on his understanding of the supply chain. So we've got three mm-hmm. items here. Item one, Ming Chi Quo is predicting a production capacity of between 400 and 600,000 units in year one. And this echoes numbers we've heard before, but the more we hear these numbers, the more likely this is. Like there were conversations previously about a million, but then there was a question of like, is that a million units or is that a misunderstanding of a million displays being available, which would be half a million units. And so I feel like we are coalescing now on this like around half a million in year one. We have no idea right now what that actually will mean in the sense of like the desire of people, you know, like my assumption is half a million is not going to be enough. I don't know what you think. Right. I oh, I think I I suspect, I mean, you never know, but it feels to me like the price is there in part to gate demand and because they know they can't make that, they can't make so many. So you want to price it so that it comes in the ballpark. I imagine these are going to be back ordered. Yeah. Like. Yeah, that feels like that. I mean, um, it is it is possible that nobody wants first generation super expensive hardware, but I have a hard time. I just have a hard time believing that, given Apple's footprint, Apple uh, uh, selling half half a million yeah. uh, units of its newest platform in its first year. It, it's a low bar, even for the price. I don't even. even I for think what honestly, it is. like that idea of nobody wants that. I feel like nobody is in the realm of half a million units for Apple. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, for Apple. Yeah, like, that's to, absolutely to true. To say nobody, like for them, half a million units of a product which they put so much effort into, it is almost nobody, which is a wild thing to say. I, this is a little sidebar here, but yeah. I'm curious how the existence of the Vision Pro is going to affect the sale. So Meta. Um, introduced the quest three yep right yeah so i have a quest two you have the quest pro unfortunately now. for me yeah unfortunately yeah uh so this is i mean it looks looks really good and i like my quest two and i thought about buying a quest three because it's got they upgraded the camera so that more like the vision pro it's got like better uh augmented reality support by having better cameras um whereas the it was all sort of hacked into the uh, quest two and it wasn't very good. <laughs> it's it's black and white and grainy and bad, but they did sort of hack it in there uh, after the fact. Uh, I, and I say this just because the thing that's keeping me from potentially buying a Quest 3 literally is the Vision Pro is just hanging out there, yeah. right? It's like, and I know I'm not, I'm not a perfect example because I cover this for a living and I mean, I'm going to buy a Vision Pro regardless because I need to for my work. But... It is also like, mm, like that's coming. Do I really want to invest in any other platform? And I, I wonder uh, how it'll go for Meta, uh, and whether whether the Vision Pro is a thing that is so far out there, and in terms of time and in terms of price, that it doesn't matter for the people who might buy something like a Quest Three, or if it is a. Because I also think there's an argument to be made that the Quest Three is going to is designed for stuff that the Vision Pro isn't designed for and that they're very different. But I do wonder if Vision Pro being out there uh, is going to suppress sales of other products in the category in the meantime, at least. Maybe. Something it's to complicated to say, right, because the price difference is so large. Because what is the Quest 3, like $500? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's 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 not even close, right? Yeah. And yet, like, but there's this question, like, yeah, but am I going to buy a headset now and then buy a headset again next year? Do you put it off? I don't know. I, I don't know. Or 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 does the detail, I'll, I'll take the other side, does the detail of the Vision Pro costing what it costs um, make it easier to write it off and say, oh, well, I was worried about Apple's new headset, but now I'm not because I'm not going to buy that. So I'll buy this uh, this Quest 3. Also, I do wonder, a side note, um, if the price of the Quest Pro is so much larger that when you see the Quest 3, you're like, oh, what a relief. That one is cheaper. I'll I mean, buy I feel one. like a fool for buying the Quest Pro because like, mm. the best the best feature about the Quest Pro was the pass-through, and they're saying that the Quest 3 is even better. So why on earth did I need to pay three times the price then? Right. I, I don't really understand that. Um, it kind of For that one great Cortex episode, that's why. Yeah, and I will say, like for me personally, it did make sense because we did a good episode of Cortex, and I think that it helped me with talking about the Vision Pro as well. So, like, mm-hmm. it was actually a very good investment. Uh, but if we take that part out of it and just think about th- maybe other people that bought them, it is a bit, you know, especially when they're talking about, like, even, you know, Meta is, is saying, like, oh, yeah, it's way better than the Quest Pro. It's like, so why on earth did you 
make this product? Like, it's very strange. Very strange. <laughs> Weird outlier product. <laughs> like, what would have happened to the Quest 3 if the Quest Pro sold better? Would they have not released the Quest 3? Like, if the Quest Pro was a big success, what would have happened? I don't know. I think that it may be that the Quest Pro was, um, that the Quest 3 is a recalibration because of the Quest Pro not doing very well, yeah. but I don't know. Interesting. Um, Actually, this does dovetail right back into Minchi Kuo's second point. Uh, Kuo believes Apple have changed course on a cheaper version of the Vision Pro and believes that Apple will struggle to reduce the cost of a potential product enough to make it viable for planned 2025 release. So the question that yeah. we've been asked a million times, which is hard to answer, of what will they cut out? Well, maybe Apple's struggling with that exact question themselves and they can't cut out enough. Yeah, I have... Uh... This is interesting in so many levels because it's it's the question of like how do they define the platform and and I think it's also interesting because they don't know right I think part of it is the the, the challenge they're in now is they're trying to plan the future of this product and it hasn't reached regular people yet mm -hmm. and so they have to use their best judgment but their best judgment is never going to meet reality it's never going to match what you can get from having it ship shipping a product and seeing what happens and so it's very hard to build a roadmap when you don't know. Um, because if you're trying to pull out features from this product in order to make a cheaper version, right, certainly there are going to be arguments about what defines this, what defines the Vision Pro and the Vision OS experience that cannot be omitted from any version. Mm -hmm. and, and these are the same arguments that they presumably have been having all along. And so presumably the people who would win those arguments are the people who won those arguments before. And so... Without reality to buttress the arguments of the uh, people who might have a disagreement, you're going to end up with a diff – it's going to be difficult to compromise on your low-end product if you really have this um, idea in your head about what the Vision OS experience is. So that makes it really hard, and we've heard you know ver various things like, oh, no, no, that outward-facing display is a must – for all Vision Pro or Vision OS hardware. It's like, really? Like, that would seem like that would be the first thing that could go, but they're like, no, but philosophically, it's very important. I'm like, okay, but you're, how are you going to make this cheaper? So it's possible, if uh, Quo's report is accurate, that, um, that they've basically said either we don't know or we can't do it or there's no point uh, because the... Uh, it's also a supply issue, right? Like, they're having such supply issues with the Vision Pro itself and even if they downgrade the displays and they might argue about that, like, are they going to have the ability to get those other kinds of displays? And is it going to be of good enough quality? So I, I would write this all off. Is it worth selling a cheaper version if you can't yet suffice demand for the expensive one? Exactly. So my guess is this is kicking the can down the road, letting the Vision Pro ship, working on what the next generation Vision Pro is, and then either doing the Tim Cook thing and taking the first generation Vision Pro and discounting it when the second one comes out or using what you learned with that first generation and building the second generation to then work on that Vision 1 or whatever down the road but it did it always seemed very ambitious that they were going to do a cheaper version in the short term and I think this is Apple saying yeah we know this is going to take a lot longer and we aren't cuz I believe that they that the Vision Pro is not that far off from what they think is like the baseline acceptable experience, and how do you how do you make those decisions and then say yeah, but we're gonna we're gonna ship something to, that'll be more appealing to the masses a year later that is below the bar we've set. <laughs> That's a that is a tough thing to do. So I'm not too surprised that they might just kick this thing down the road and and it means. The problem is it means for developers that the number of people who are going to be using this platform is going to be small for a lot longer than maybe they anticipated. Quo also expects that a Vision Pro 2 is unlikely to be available until at least 2027. Yikes. I mean, I guess it's yeah. closer to... I mean, maybe even further these days, but we think well, of it more on the refresh rate of a Mac. Well, if you think about... Think about this as almost being a product that's shipping in year minus one. <laughs> like they, they, they can't. They are struggling for with capacity, right? Already, and that, and so for twenty four, half a million units, and there's a challenge for what is it in twenty five, 
And what is it in 26? Like, it may be several years before they can even ship the original in any decent quantity. And it, and if that's true, I mean, I'm I'm sure. Imagine what they're what sites they've set for Vision Pro two, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's probably an even more impossible product to make today, right? And will it even be there? Uh, will the parts even be there when they expect? So it, it's a, it's a funny thing because I don't think it's Apple's will here. I think it's also um, what's available. And clear clearly with the Vision Pro, like they chose technology that is very expensive and very hard to make and can't be made in high volume, at least yeah. not yet. Continuing with information from Ming-Chi Kuo on a different tact, he has said that the mm. 2024 MacBooks and iPads will, of course, feature M3 chips, but also states that his expectation is that the device demand may fall below expectations due to a, quote, lack of growth drivers. Joe Rossigno at Mac Rumors suggests that this is probably relating to work from home device sales. Like this has been a big thing for these products over the last few years and that has changed. I'm just hoping that he is not suggesting that the new iPad Pro does not see a significant refresh because oh boy, is it time. Yeah. It's it's hard to tell. Um this is worth since we're talking about Ming Chi Kuo here, it's worth talking about that he had a report that uh, John Gruber uh, wrote about on Daring Fireball. He had a report about the overheating reports for the iPhone 15. Oh, yeah. That was very clearly a uh, TSMC plant that was, oh, uh, it's not us. <laughs> it's not our chip. Whatever's going on in this in this thing that's, that's turned out to not be much of a story, uh, big surprise, uh, new iPhones come out. Um, they run hot for a while. There's maybe a bug in there too. It's just not a big deal. But he did this story about it and it was like, oh no, this isn't that problem. And it's clearly coming from TSMC. And it's worth doing the thing that we do on Upgrade a lot, which is say, consider the source. How do they know the information they know? What are they good at? What are they maybe not as good at? Uh, Ming-Chi Kuo is a very well-respected, good source of information about the supply chain in Asia. Very good at that. When <laughs> Ming-Chi Kuo starts getting into, you know, punditry analysis, stuff that is not in his wheelhouse, you should be more skeptical. So uh, this is this is an example where I would say I will take his report about M3 chips in MacBooks and iPads. I mean, this to report his, from his, him, though, it's not wrong. Let me read it. So no, this, it's, this it's not wrong. I'm just quotes, saying. Quotes. So I'm just saying you gotta back you gotta back it off a little bit because there's the stuff that's in his wheelhouse and there's the stuff that's not like no source because we talk about Mark Gurman a lot here too. Yeah. No source is even a solid source is solid about everything. It so be. it's worth scoring them based on, like, what are they good at, and then what does it feel like it's a little bit on the outside. Right, I want to read what Quo said, This is what John Gruber linked to. He says, Quo says, My survey indicates that the iPhone 15 Pro series overheating issues are unrelated to TSMC's advanced three anemone and Node. The primary cause is more likely the compromises made in the thermal system designed to achieve a lighter weight, such as the reduced heat dissipation area and the use of a titanium frame, which negatively impacts thermal efficiency. It's expected Apple will address this through software updates, but improvements may be limited unless Apple lowers processor performance. If Apple does not properly address this issue, it could negatively impact shipments over the product life cycle of the iPhone 15 Pro series. Like, I don't... This doesn't sound wrong to me. So like so okay there's there's a couple things. Apple says that the there's uh, a software bug. Apple says there's a bug, but Apple says that the heat dissipation that he suggests the titanium frame and the reduced heat dissipation area, Apple says that's not true. Well, Apple he, told he Gruber say that's not more true. More likely. Right? right like is is what he said he didn't say for sure but yeah, it, but it what, is but a look, software thing that Apple's it, going to address which he also says. There so is like accuracy in here but he's also doing some work for TSMC to get it off of their back here, right? And saying, it oh, like it might be that, yeah. it might be this problem with the titanium. It might be the titanium. And Apple's like, it's not the titanium, okay? Mm-hmm. And also, that last sentence, if Apple doesn't address this issue, it could hurt the sales of the iPhone. And the, and the stock went down. <laughs> and it's like, well, duh, if Apple doesn't properly address the issue of the most important product, then it might be a problem. But mm. is it an issue? And will Apple address it? Those are the questions there, and and that's I, I guess that's what I'm saying is, he's not 
wrong. And when he's in his bailiwick, he's really good. But he's straying a little bit here because, again, you have to ask, like, where did this come from? And it feels very strongly to me and to Gruber that he's doing some work for TSMC, right? TSMC is like, it's not us. It's not us. Don't blame this on us. It's not us. And so he's like, all right, I'm going to put out a thing that says, hey, here's a bunch of other things it could be. But you know what? It's not. It's not TSMC's processors. That's what it's not. Yeah, but it's like this. These these apps that are overheating iPhones are they just overheating the new iPhones? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because if they it, are, again, why? It, it, right, and there might be a, an OS bug that's related to the hardware. But also remember that when these devices ship out, they uh, they are indexing every photo, and they're doing spotlight indexing, and they're syncing a bunch of stuff. And like a newly in, uh, installed iPhone runs hot for a while anyway. Yeah, but also there's the question of like. You know, Instagram maybe Instagram is using Uber, an API wrong. They, they named right. specifically, which I found to yeah. be very weird. Like, as yeah, a thing. right. It's not it's us. kind of like third parties. Wh- why can they even companies you don't do like? That? <laughs> yeah, so. Companies you don't like are at, at, at fault here, not Apple. Uh, anyway, I, anyway, I I wanted this is me actually defending Ming Chi Kuo because sometimes I feel like you get that other lack of nuance, which is like Ming Chi Kuo. You know, he said this thing, and he's in TSMC's pocket. It's like, no, Ming Chi Kuo is great at what he does, which is the supply chain stuff. Like, I, I believe him. The lack of growth drivers explanation. Sometimes his explanations are where I have to apply a little more skepticism because yeah. he's trying to take the facts he know and then build the narrative around it yeah. in order to make his facts feel complete or relevant or whatever and he's not necessarily wrong right like it could mean that the ipad pro is not going to get a bigger refresh it could just mean as joe russignol friend of the show says at mac rumors that this is all part of the same story which is the pandemic sold a lot of ipads and laptops Mm -hmm. and those people are on a new cycle they came a little bit ahead they bought that new ipad and laptop then and they're not going to buy another one two years later they're not so it, the sales are going to be lower and that's just how it's going to be regardless like because there's also this thing that happens especially in business journalism a lot where there's this uh like bloomberg does this a lot where it's like a happened and then b happened and therefore they're connected right it's like it, it's this it's this uh correlation causation problem that happens um and and i see this with uh, device sales sometimes too which is oh they're going to put m3 chips in there but uh but demand may uh, not follow. It's like, you know, updating a computer doesn't necessarily mean that sales surge, right? That's not, it's not that simple because you got to take into account a whole bunch of other things. So you don't necessarily have to make those connections and you don't necessarily have to make those narratives and build them, but people do. So that's, that's why we're here, Mike. Yep. Benjamin Mayo at 9to5Mac is reporting on information shared by Business F1 magazine that Apple is looking at trying to secure worldwide rights for Formula One. Hmm. They are reportedly looking at a deal that will be ultimately worth $2 billion a year, which is double the current rights fee. Like if looked at what, what they are looking at, what F1 rights are, are worth worldwide. worldwide. The issue with this, and the interesting part of this, is the way in which the rights are structured. So if Apple were to strike this deal, they would not actually be able to secure the global rights at the same time. They would have to get them on a rolling schedule until all of the contracts expire in the different territories that are all over the next five years. So U.S. rights are in 2025, so that would probably be first, then other territories later on. Apple is expected to make a seven-year deal for this reason and then also double the rights fees. Right. It would be very interesting to see how they would handle this. Um, F1 TV, for example, is like something that people really enjoy. Um, if you're outside of some markets, like I can't get F1 TV because Sky has that very locked down here. Um, but mm-hmm. F1 TV is like a pretty technologically rich platform. Like you can watch like dozens and dozens of camera feeds. You get live data and all that kind of stuff. Would Apple want to do that? I don't know, maybe. But it, th- there yeah. is a lot of interesting stuff that could be done with F1. I think it is a really good set of rights to try and acquire if possible um, because it's a growing sport. And it's a it's a sport I think with a like quite a high index in advertising for like you know yeah. the the market that's watching it. 
Um, it's an interesting one to go for, but a complicated one because it is so chopped up. And Sky, who you know have the rights here, are like very closely linked with F1. So like outside of the UK, the Sky feed is the main feed. So like if you watch it on ESPN, sometimes you get told about features for Sky customers <laughs> on ESPN, uh, yeah. which you obviously yeah. can't get, but it's baked into the commentary it's so the broadcast right super interesting i would i would be so, interested intrigued to see if or if anything happens there so yeah so demographics are good and it's international and this is one of the things that i think apple ideally wants there was a story last week uh talking to eddie q i guess about a little bit about or a story about eddie q and about sports rights and all of that that i thought was really interesting um international is better for apple right apple views itself as a global company it's a lot easier if it's something that you can buy and you can put everywhere and there's a couple ways to do that you know the easy way is something like mls that didn't really have international partners and you just to speak of anyway and you just buy it all and say we we're going to put this everywhere in the world and that allows Messi to be watched on apple tv plus in or on the mls league pass in argentina and you know in europe and wherever else right that's great okay great but um, a lot of a lot of uh, what sports are truly international like that. There are not that many, um, and F one is one of them. So that's interesting. It is yeah interesting from a technological standpoint. The challenge ends up being rights again, and I, I like I'm intrigued by the idea that how does Apple solve that? One of the ways Apple maybe solves that is swooping in and saying we're going to make a deal that's long term. And we will assume the rights in all territories as they expire. That sounds really interesting, right? We will pay you. And then as we pick up new territories, we will pay an increased fee. We'll start with the ones that are expiring in 25, rolling until all the way till 2030. And we're, we'll actually go to 2032 with a deal, let's say. And we're going to pay you... Um, an average of $2 billion a year over the course of the contract, but it'll be based on as the rights phase in to mm -hmm. us. All sounds really interesting and possible and something that Apple might want to do. And if you throw in that, like with, with Drive to Survive and stuff like that, like Apple would get on the documentary uh, train as well. They already are. Uh, with as they well yeah and and we've seen like two messy documentaries like they that would become a priority as well so you build content around it yeah. there's I mean, a lot there's a point they're making a documentary about lewis hamilton and then they have the movie See. the brad pitt movie so and then they also have um the possibility of doing some stuff on linear with linear partners mm -hmm. um that that uh it's an interesting idea of what they could do i will put out one caveat that i know from other sports which is Sometimes the way these sports rights are written, you can't, as an entity, negotiate a future version of the contract until a certain point. You're not yeah. technically allowed, legally allowed to renegotiate. And in some cases, there is a whole like for the year before it expires or for a, a year period, two years before it expires, you have exclusive renegotiation rights mm -hmm. as the rights holder. Mm -hmm. So that's my question is, I'm not sure if F1 was like, yeah, we're going to take $2 billion from Apple. It's going to run from 25 to 32. Um, it's a done deal. We're going to take it up. It'll start rolling out in 25 with the U S and then roll across the rest of the world as those rights expire. I don't know if they can make that deal is my only question. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. cause does sky say, well, no, you can't negotiate with anyone for the rights until 29 when our rights are, or 28 until right before our rights expire. And we have a, we can match any offer, et cetera, et cetera. Right. They could. So there's, there's a lot of questions here, but everything about this report makes sense to me in terms of how Apple and Eddie Q are viewing their approach to sports. Yep. And um, Mark Gurman is reporting that Apple is developing more search engine technology. So obviously Apple have their own search tools in the App Store and in Maps, like they built their own stuff for that, um, as well as Spotlight. This is like Mark highlights some of this stuff. It's in uh, John Gian Andrea's team. 
uh, Gene Andrew is the head of AI and machine learning at Apple and apparently has a very large team, Mark Gurman calls it, dedicated to creating search technologies. Mark Gurman is reporting that this team is, quote, now looking to more deeply integrate Apple search features into iOS and macOS and potentially bolster the technology of its new generative AI tools, a system known internally as Pegasus. Apple are apparently hesitant to have their own web search become a thing due to its lucrative agreement with Google, unless they're able to create a system that could generate their own and re- ad revenue. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, also uh, that Microsoft wanted Apple to buy Bing <laughs> at one point. Yes, that was a and thing they, that was spoken about this week, yes. And and they couldn't, couldn't have... Uh, it, they couldn't come to an agreement about it. I think this is fascinating, right? Because it's this idea that Apple is building search tech, but the um, the Google deal is so lucrative that they aren't gonna, you know, they, they aren't gonna bother because Google pays them so well. Mark does it makes me wonder that potentially they they use it as like a negotiating chip as well. Like, also, right? Well, yeah. it's it's an Apple Maps esque kind of thing yeah. where it's like you 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 don't have us over a barrel. We could build this or we could partner with somebody else. And we know that they have so many, some, you know, huge ad ambitions that this could be a part of. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it doesn't, I I don't know. I I think it's interesting. I, as, as a podcaster, I think about Apple building, you know, how Apple's podcast crawler works where it's, so, you know, it's gotten better, but it's like, sometimes it misses things. (laughs) You got to kick it a little bit and all that. And I try to imagine a whole web crawler, but I guess they already do it. They've got a web crawler and they use it and and they surface it in some places and they surface Bing data in some places. But primarily, if you're in Safari, by default, you get Google and there's a huge deal for that. I do wonder if with the uh, the uh, the legal case going on, if that there's also a hedge going on here where Apple might realize like if they can't make the if they're not allowed to have that same kind of deal with Google anymore, maybe that's when they put, you know, plan B into place and plan B, plan B is not Bing or some kind of an auction. It's literally, no, we're going to just use Apple search from now on and we're going to monetize it ourselves. We're going to make ads. We're going to put ads all over search pages and that's how we're going to do it. I don't do, know. Do you think that the Google, the, the, the Google, so the deal is that Google pays Apple billions of dollars to be the default search engine on the iPhone when you search for something. Do you think that this arrangement is in contrast to Apple's stance on privacy? I I think it's complicated, but (laughs) yes. That's for sure. Okay. The simple version is yes. Like the simple version is if if there was no money on the line, let's do it, think of it this way. If there was no money on the line and it was purely a customer experience thing that Apple was caring about and that like the default search engine didn't make Apple any money at all regardless, I think they would either have built their own search or they would use some or they would have bought or would use DuckDuckGo. Or some other, you know, there's some others out there, but that kind of thing. I think they would have gravitated a long time ago toward a more privacy-focused search engine. But it's an enormous amount of money that they make from Google, and that, and then they are they are by default turning their users to what is, I will say, probably the best search experience still. Mm-hmm. Although search is getting worse by the day, but it's probably the best one. But at the price of being in Google's data funnel. And, you know, I, I, so I think that you could argue that Google is, I mean, I use Google search because I've tried the others. I'm like, "Mm -mm, nope, back to Google search. Right. And that, that is a customer product quality kind of concern. You heard of Kagi? I have heard of Kagi. It's getting yeah. a bit of buzz at the moment. Which old school Mac users will remember used to be a completely different company and they went bankrupt. They hurt a lot of software developers and then somebody bought the domain and is making a new Wait, product and it's a four pay the, search engine. The, the, was that like a payment system? Yeah, it yeah. was. It was Ka- Kagi was how you bought your shareware back in the day. Yeah. I know this was um, James Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. And they and they went out of business and basically was like, oh yeah, we owe you developers a lot of money. You're not ever going to get it. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. Search for it. Yeah. I suppose. 
Yeah, Maybe back. You want to? The, <laughs> yeah, I guess now <laughs> you could do that. Search for it. Good luck. Just go to Kagi and say, "Where's my money?" <laughs> you know. Maybe. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's a paid. It's like a paid. You have to subscribe to be in their yeah. search. Anyway, yeah. my and this is my point is is like. Yes, Apple's choosing a good product, but they're not, I don't think they're choosing it for those reasons. I think they're choosing it because of money. And if all they cared about was privacy and not money, they would have a different default search experience or they would have a, you know, little thing that came up and said, oh, choose your search engine. But they do not. You have to go dig in the settings if you want to change your search engine. Yeah, I feel like that would probably be the way it would work, that they would ask you, right? I feel like that that's what would happen probably if didn't pay the money because they, I yeah think they it probably would be wouldn't like say ask. oh you're you're using Bing now everybody's using Bing now and yeah. users would be like what did you do and so instead they would ask Also even I mean I'm curious about the Apple uh, Google deal because there's I mean sh- the exclusivity is obviously part of it but surely you could and maybe this will be the end result of all of this um l- litigation that's going on the idea that maybe it's just all based on affiliate revenue, essentially, that like ads served that come from these from Apple's Safari, Apple gets a percentage of it, and that's what Apple gets paid. I just think it's and best if there's no they, money that changes hands. And and they well, the problem is is that they're feeding Google's business, so money is changing hands. So, but you could do it where it's like, look, Apple makes money regardless because everybody who owns a search engine pays us if we if you set it as the default. Um, I think that there's, yeah, you're right. I think it would be best if money did not change hands. But if that's the case, then I think Apple would just go to their own search engine and make money off of ad placements on their search engine because like, like there's money to be made in search. If, if we line. were saying that any search engine, like then it's like, well, couldn't any website have to pay Apple? That you know what I mean? Like just because you're using Safari, like it, right, like it gets weird. Like, I, well, I mean, I as would the, prefer yeah, as if, the default, if, but yeah, I would prefer if Apple and Google did not have this deal. I just think it muddies things in a way that annoys me. Right, that like we have app tracking transparency on one end, and then we also have like Google is the web, default web web search. tracking obscurity on the other end, and it's all just like uh, yeah. it, I don't know where this deal sits in that flow. It's just like a very you, strange thing to me. I'm sure that you are making an argument that's been made inside Apple, which is this is what we should do, and I think what it is is this is what we should do. We should do our own search engine, and we can monetize it as we like. But as we know from Apple, philosophically, Apple thinks, well, but when we do it, it isn't evil, right? Because we're Apple, and you trust us, and we're not going to do hinky things with the data. We're going to ser- serve you ads like we do on the App Store, but we're not going to do all the stuff that Google does with your data. We're not going to build a, a, a profile that we share with other people. We're not going to do any of that. We're just going to be Apple, and you trust us, right? Like that, and that's the thing. We can argue about what they're saying there and how self-serving it is and do they really mean it and are they truly not tracking you, which of course they are, but they're tracking you inside Apple, which is a first party and therefore they don't consider it uh, hinky. They they think it's fine because it's Apple. But uh, that would be their argument, right? Is ultimately, and I'm sure those people get shouted down by the people who are like, $9 billion a year. <laughs> They're like, okay, well, you win this one, Whatever but we'll be, we'll just sit here and I wait for the day. This conversation may happen a lot, and then it gets to the point where they're like, oh, but this comes out of services revenue. And then they go, well, oh, no, our stock price. And then they don't do it. Because if one year, all yeah. of a sudden, billions <laughs> of dollars has disappeared from the part that's meant to be saving the company into the future and in Wall Street, <laughs> like they just they just say, oh, no, we can't do this. And then they move on. Yeah, no, that's it. It, it. It's literally there's a meeting where it's like, okay, here are all the reasons. I got I got a keynote here. Here are all the reasons. Uh, we're gonna we should use our own search. And it's like it's better for users. We make money on on ads. You know, da da da. And then, and then literally the person at the other end of the table says, "Oh no, our stock price." <laughs> and then the, that's end. the end of it. End, end of end conversation. Of and, and that's why it will take like a legal ruling, I think. And that's why I think that this is going on in the background. Is like we need to have the ability to switch gears if the spigot dries up because google could also be like yeah you know you can do what you want with us we're not gonna make a we're not gonna make this deal anymore or the or google might say we can't guys we can't make this deal anymore (laughs) um they're looking at us so i don't know i don't know but i do think ultimately it would be um better for users privacy the question is would an apple search engine be any good (laughs) good question i don't know 
This episode is brought to you by Uni. Uni is the world's number one pizza oven company. They make surprisingly small ovens powered by your choice of wood, charcoal, gas, or even electric now as well. They let you make restaurant quality pizza in your own backyard, in your own home. Uni pizza ovens are super easy to use and incredibly portable. And they'll fit into any outside space. They can reach temperatures of up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit or 500 degrees Celsius to enable you to cook restaurant quality pizza in as little as 60 seconds. The high temperature is what you need to separate these pizzas in an uni from what you can make in a conventional home oven. Uni have tons of awesome options available you can look at the unicoda 16 which is a gas powered oven that can cook pizzas of up to 16 inches and have an innovative l-shaped burner at the back to give you even heat distribution they have the unikaru where you can choose your heat source wood charcoal or gas they have the uni vault which can let you cook a wonderful pizza indoors with the power of electricity Uni also make an app that can help you perfect your dough recipe and give you loads of pizza making tips. Uni pizza ovens start from just $299 with free shipping to the US, the UK, and the EU. Jason, is this still pizza making time over at the Snow House? Is there ever not pizza making time? Well, there's never not pizza making time, and it is still outdoor pizza making time because, of course, we have the very extended lovely fall um, we're going to have very a very nice week this week, in fact. And I have, I can reveal exclusively here on Upgrade Please that do. we have uh, mozzarella mm. and turkey pepperoni in the Snell refrigerator mm. getting ready for this week. A uh, It's pizza time. And I make enough dough for two, so it's two pizza time. It's 2x pizza time. 2x pizza time. And the, the uni uh, is out on the, on the table in the backyard um, attached to its... Propane cylinder, getting ready to go to heat up nice and hot and make that beautiful, beautiful, um, beautiful crust and and little uh, burn top and all of the things that make it feel like it came out of a, a fancy wood oven somewhere, even though um, it's not. It's just from a, a fancy oven in my backyard. Look, be like Jason Snell. Make it 2x pizza time in your house. You can get up to 10% of your purchase of an Uni pizza oven which could be up to $50 off the Unicoda 16, which is the model Jason has, by going to uni.com, that's O-O-N-I.com, and use the code UPGRADE2023 at checkout. They also have a bunch of accessories there, so you can kit out everything you need to make the very best pizza that you've ever had at home. It's the perfect tool for the job. Uni pizza ovens are a product always in high demand, so go and check it out for yourself. It's uni.com, O-O-N-I.com. Use the code UPGRADE2023 for 10% off. Uni pizza ovens are the best way to bring restaurant-quality pizza to your own backyard. Now, thanks to Uni pizza ovens for their support of this show and Relay FM. This might be the last time now, truly, that we go to the B-Tales, Jason Snow. <laughs> To talk about Mac OS Sonoma. Yeah. The B-Tales will be back. The B-Tales will return. The B-Tales will return. But it's the end of, uh, I mean, well, there, there'll be, it's going to be betas with new features in it. The B-Tales may, be, may right? be surprisingly resilient. But yeah, Mac OS Sonoma shipped. Hooray. 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 I, I did a bunch of, uh, I, I have a bunch of computers that I had like, this computer runs Sonoma and this computer is not running Sonoma. So I can do, and all of that is over now. There are, the, I, I, I've switched back to various computers that were previously sort of like replaced with beta versions and all that. Anyway, so yeah, Sonoma everywhere now. Yeah, I have some, I was just planning on putting Sonoma on my MacBook Air. I was not planning on putting it on my MacBook Pro, which is my recording machine, mm-hmm. um, because I always like to just wait it out for a little bit just in case. Sure. Yeah. But then I went to Safari and I'd enabled profiles and then couldn't access any of my tab groups. Mm. So now both of my machines are on Sonoma, are on Sonoma. because I, I need to be you. able to use my web browser <laughs> yeah, indeed. in the way that I'm used to using That's it. That's how they get you. That's how yep. they get you. You called it in your review small, like the updates are small, but in all the best ways. I suspect that most macOS users just want incremental improvements about disruptive changes. Slow and steady wins the race. I think there's something to that, that the, um, the idea that... Sometimes these updates get judged on like how many things got poured into them, how many new features, how many extra things. And it feels like, I mean, iOS, you could say this too, but certainly on the Mac that's been around for so long now that I don't think most Mac users want their OS updates to like completely change how they use their Mac, right? Like they don't, they want it. 
they want some incremental improvements and they want the platform improvements that are across all of Apple's platforms, but they don't, I, I don't think they want to be disrupted. I think they just want it to get better every year. And that's the good thing about Sonoma is that it is not disruptive really, but it does add a bunch of uh, new features and some of them are very nice. I was very impressed with some of the like detail work that Apple did. Mm. Uh, I want to talk about a few areas. I think the key areas I've, uh, I can see five of them, and I also these came from your review, so I think that oh. these are kind of like the key parts. Widgets well, I agree. is probably the big, the biggest feature, I reckon, for most people. Yeah. Um, whether you want it or not, like it's a big change. So we have widgets on the desktop; they're interactive as well. Um, mm -hmm. You don't seem to be a big fan of widgets on the Mac. No, I, it's not. Look, I just had a realization that I don't dislike them. I think they make less of an impact than they do on iOS and iPad OS. Okay. I think that's that's the thing, that's the point that I wanted to make there is that th they are because so much of iOS and iPad OS is one app at a time, home screen's really important. You put things on the home, screen, the home screen, you get your lot. apps there. It, it's a it's a more powerful thing and also interactive widgets, right? The idea that when you're out on the home screen, you don't need to launch an app. You can just very quickly interact with a widget. I had this moment of, of realization where I was writing about, oh, like, oh, interactive widgets are now interactive. So for example, and I, I thought about it and I was like, for example, you could put a to-do, like a reminders widget on your desktop and check the boxes off. And I thought, or you could just keep reminders open <laughs> and check the boxes it's it, does that make sense like the idea that on a mac having a bunch of apps open and a bunch of windows in various places and like that's just how the mac works and so i don't see the need to have my reminders uh widget open on my desktop i could just have reminders open yeah. and put it over in wherever it is and it's the whole app and when i click on it i have the whole app there and and so that's part of it it's just it it's less Again, not that interactive widgets are bad, but they have less appeal on the Mac. And the widgets on the desktop, like, it's good, but but the average Mac user, not all of us, a lot of us have big screens, but, like, the Mac most people use is a laptop, which means there's not a lot of screen real estate, which means you probably got a lot of windows open, which means you probably don't see a lot of your desktop, and that's where yeah. they're hiding. So they're not ambient. You have to go looking for them which was the problem in Notification Center. It's not as bad as Notification Center. They set the default that if you literally click on the on the wallpaper on the desktop, everything hides. Plus there's a keyboard shortcut, plus there's a trackpad gesture. There's lots of ways to get there. But by sticking them on the desktop, they are behind your content. And on a 27 inch monitor, there's room. I can mm -hmm. see spaces of my desktop. On my MacBook Air, there's not so much room and they're less useful there. Yeah. And also the scale is weird. On the Mac, like they're they're kind of too big. Everything's kind of a little bit, they I think, large. too big. Uh, and I think that's just be a scale thing between Mac OS and iOS that the scale is different, but they they feel unnecessarily large, which means they take up even more space than than you maybe need them to. I, all of this said, I don't think they're bad. I like widgets. I think widgets are fun. I think the fact that you can run iPhone widgets from your iPhone and put them on your Mac is great Very because cool. there's certain apps that don't run on the Mac, even though they should, because they're iPhone only or because they've unchecked that box and they're like, no, this app cannot be available on the Mac. I don't understand it. It's very frustrating. Now you can get those widgets to run. That's really great too. Like there's a lot, th the way you place them on the screen is really nice where it, it, it sort of lets you free, freely place them. But if they're near another widget, it'll give you like some alignment guides so you can make them like look all nice. Mm -hmm. It's really well done. And if you've got a lot of uh, files on your desktop, they all move out of the way <laughs> magically as you drag the widget around to place it and then they stay away from it. So there's a lot of good detail here. I just had that moment where I thought to myself, I'm less excited about widgets on the Mac and interactive widgets on the Mac than I am on Apple's other platforms because they feel very much like they're a, they're like an A plus or okay, maybe not. They're a grade A, let's say idea on an iPhone or an iPad on the Mac. You know, it's like a B or a B minus. It's, it's just not, it's just not as amazing because the Mac is the Mac and, and if that makes any sense. So I really like them. Um, I, one of the things that helps me use the widgets more is I'm a stage manager user where you cannot turn off the clicking on the desktop shows you to desktop. It's just not 
available for you to turn off. Yes. So I see them more because, and also just you being click. a stage manager user, you are just you just right. see your desktop Fewer more windows. all the time yeah. because that's just how it is. So it actually works pretty well for my use case. Um, and I like having them there. I like, as you mentioned, that like you know I only have a couple of windows at a time, and I'm able to position some widgets in ways that like I'm going to see them when I need them. Like I can see uh, some shortcuts widgets that I might want to use while I'm recording. I can see my um, my timery thing while I'm recording, so I can see my time trackers that are going on. Right. Um, I really like it. But I I have a request for Apple that I'm going to make on this show. I would like mm-hmm. Apple to take a look at iPad OS and learn from it. So. On iPad OS, in portrait and landscape orientation, you can set your home screens independently. And when you move mm-hmm. from, maybe people don't know this, but whatever layout you do in portrait, you can put your iPad into landscape. You can set a different layout and it remembers yeah. both layouts. And the widgets can go anywhere. Anywhere. Even it's free placement, basically. Mm-hmm. So you can even put them like way down where there aren't icons and it will work. Mm-hmm. It's true. With the laptop and external display situation, it is a nightmare mm. because if I y- open my laptop screen, they are in a completely different uh, uh, order to what I left them in on my desktop. And then when I like with my my screen, and then when I plug it back into my screen, they weren't where I left them last time. They've now oh, moved again. No, so ev- no. if you're a laptop user, every time you dare to open your laptop, your widgets all move and they never go back to the way that you accept them to. No, that is I don't like wild that. to me that they shipped it this way. Mm-hmm. I, ca- I just can't, I cannot understand how that happened. But that happened. Uh, I would like the yeah. locations to be remembered. I even had one today where I, uh, uh, I was testing this out before the show where I had set all my widgets up and I unplugged it and I opened my MacBook Air and I had two widgets overlapping each other, which was fun. So I had a big widget and a small widget in the middle of the big widget for a different app. They had just, <laughs> one had just gone on top of the other. And this is in Sonoma <laughs> as it is shipping to the world <sighs> today. But big fan of widgets. Uh, I hope that they maybe tighten that up a little bit. Um, but I, I think that it's a cool feature that yeah. I'm happy to have. I think it would be better if it were... Uh, yeah, there's some detail work that could be done. I'd like the scaling to change, honestly. Um, I would like it to be either... I'd like to be able to bring them to the top instead of having to hide all your windows because I think that there's a scenario where you might want a widget on top but mm. see the content that's like in your windows it? in order to... Or or just temper either pin it on top or temporarily bring it to the top. But yeah, I would like some more placement because they're like right now they're like stickers stuck on the wallpaper, right? They don't they don't ever leave that bottom layer, and um, I can see scenarios where I'd actually like to have them either floating like a picture in picture window or temporarily above my content so I could do, for example, like look at the Google Doc in front of me while I put something in a interactive widget, and they don't do that. Like the only way to do that is to move your windows around so that the widget is visible mm. and your window is visible and and uh, all that. I didn't even mention the other reason that I'm less excited about them is um, Mac has the dock and it has the menu bar. <laughs> so it's got lots of other places where you can put stuff. And so the widgets, although they're nice, again, they feel less essential because the Mac has already solved a bunch of these problems. And so, yeah, that's that's part of the that's part of the story. Uh, video screensavers, you said, I'm incredibly impressed with the fit and finish Apple has put into the transition from screensaver to desktop. So this is like the Apple TV like movies and then they fade into the desktop. You really seem to like this feature. Yeah, it's just, this is another one of those examples of them doing detail work that's not necessary. Um, I think I mentioned this one when it went into beta, but like they've got, okay, they've got all the aerial screensavers and they've got uh, from Apple TV and you can make them not only your screensaver, but your desktop. And everybody expects that. I, I think the, what, what do you think that feature would work like? You would think that it would be that when the screensaver is done and you're, and you're back to your computer, there's like a bloop and it goes from your screensaver to the backdrop. And they're from the same, you know, they're from the same image from the same movie, but they're not, obviously they're not the same. 
Or if you give them a little more credit, you'd say there that it, you know, you do that and it, it immediately stops and the frame that you're on is, the, is now your wallpaper. And that's not what happens. Instead, when you go from the screensaver to logging in or, you know, or, or uh, unlocking or whatever you do, what happens is the screensaver video keeps playing in the background on your wallpaper and slowly coasts to a halt. And then that's your wallpaper. And like, that is completely unnecessary, but it is the right way to do it. And it is beautiful to see. And every time I see it, I'm delighted by it. Mm. But um, and that that is, I love those moments where I think, yeah, that's an Apple feature. That is Apple going the extra mile to make something nice. Uh, that we as computer users get beaten down and we're like, yeah. Just, remember when when with um, Apple Silicon, they did the thing where in the display control panel, when you changed resolutions, it just changed them. And it used to be on Intel and prior to that, like your screen would black out. Yeah. <laughs> And, and then come back <laughs> Wake and you made it so you clicked and it, and it just changed. Mm -hmm. And you're like, what, what happened? This is a little like that, which is like, we're so beaten down that we're like, well, of course, when the screensaver ends, there's going to be a blink or a black screen or something's going to be a discontinuity is going to happen. And then I'll log in and then maybe, or, you know, I'll, I'll touch ID or whatever. And maybe it'll go to my thing and it'll be fine. Like, and, and somebody at Apple was like, no, 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 that's, don't do that. Like, there's got to be a better way. We should not accept that discontinuity. That's just being lazy. We could do better. And I love it when Apple does that because that to me is like, that is the Apple thing. That is Apple actually caring about the detail work of, of, uh, of having the screensaver delightfully transition into a background um, and kind of coasting down to a stop. It's just, is it a world changing feature? no. That's actually kind of why it impresses me is they put the work into something that is just a kind of pleasant feature when you're using your Mac, just a little pleasant thing. And the fact that they did that, I, I just, I'm very impressed. I'm impressed that they went to the trouble. They added a bunch of video um, controls and effects. Yeah. Yeah, this is moment. actually another place where they did extra, right? So they're basically hijacking the video source mm -hmm. of a camera mm -hmm. and processing it. And they're using all of the machine learning technology they built for the iPhone camera um, to do stuff like uh, subject detection and background detection. Uh, and that's how you get uh, portrait mode. And that's how you get uh, studio light, right? So the portrait mode blurs the background studio light. They're detecting the user in the foreground, the person, the subjects, and they're lightening them. And darkening the background, or, or maybe they're not touching the background; they're just lightening the the foreground. But the idea there is those are features that are happening because Apple's got this whole pipeline where they're taking the input from the camera, and then they're detecting on the fly the background and the subject, and then they can do things with that. Um, but once you've got that in the pipeline, so the apps don't need it. The apples apps don't need to like say, "Hey, give me portrait mode" or whatever. It's a system level thing. The apps just get a camera that's actually the processed output from Apple's um, from the video subsystem. That's very impressive. Um, but what happened clearly is that everybody at Apple's like, "Okay, we got this now. What can we do with it?" Like, we've got all our video segmented with foreground and background. What can we do? And so they built all of those silly video effects like the confetti and the fireworks and stuff. And like the confetti falls behind you and in front of you. Hmm. Like, because they can do that because they know where you are and they know where your background is. And so they can put layered animations in and then pass that through. And then obviously since they're, since they're processing, they can do gesture detection. So if you do two thumbs up, you'll get confetti. And if you do the devil horns, you'll get the laser show, right? Like these are all things that, that they can do because they're processing every frame of video and running it through the neural engine and they're doing all this fancy stuff. Um, and, and it's very cool but they also, they added controls, which is nice, uh, so that you can actually choose where you want to zoom and pan on something like the studio display or a continuity camera. They added, for people who are tired of the, the um, of uh, center stage moving around, mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's like a center button that you can click that centers the image on you and then stops which is really nice. A lot of details where we heard, when I complained about this, I, I know that uh, we heard from people who were like, Apple will never do webcam settings. It's too, you know, it's too complicated. And I'm like, well, they did them. They did them and they're pretty good. But the one that really gets me is the keynote stuff or, or really it's any, any, it's not keynote. It's VOIP 
presentations. So it can be any app, any window, and with some app, I think apps have to be updated to support it. Any, you know, any video conferencing app, you click on the little green button on any window and you can choose share this window into that app. And now you're, and you don't have to use the apps like window sharing UI. You can literally just click on a window and say, share this window. And then within there, they've got these two different ways of putting your video in the window. One of them is the window appears behind you like it's floating. Um, and, and if you think about it, okay, they know the foreground, they know the background. So they can, they can layer in your screen share between you and the background like it's floating. And they do all the little things like center stage knows that there's a window over there. So it doesn't center you. It puts you to the side so that you're not blocking the window. Really smart. And then their other one is the one that made me laugh. It's so hilariously unnecessary, and yet they did it, which is there's a small version where you're in the window. Instead of it showing you in your background, it just shows the window, and then there's a little circle, and your face is in it. You're like a little cartoon character. You're, yeah, except, again, we all can imagine that feature, right? They crop, they center crop, and they use center stage and their face detection or whatever, and they center crop around your face, and you appear in a little circle. That's not what they did. They detect your foreground. They detect you, right? And they detect the background. They remove the background <laughs> and just put a blank background back there. They keep your head and then you've got the circle. So it's like your shoulders and the circle and the background. But that's not it either. You're not in the circle. The top of your head kind of like pops out of the circle. Yeah. You're like popping out of a little hole, right? It's totally... And this is what I'm saying is like, is this necessary? No, it's totally unnecessary, but it's really nice. It's leveraging the technology they built in their video pipeline to do something that's just a little nice detail. And again, to, to me, that is the Apple touch that we don't always see, but you know it when you see it. And that, that again, completely unnecessary, but delightful and with this really impressive technical backing. Um, and I love that. I mean, they clearly were like, okay, if we're going to do this, what can we do with this technology of intercepting the video stream, knowing the background, knowing the foreground, uh, you know, having the center stage access and studio light and all these things, what can we do? And this is one of the things they came up with and it's really nice. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, you may not ever use this feature, but uh, I, I just, I appreciate they went to the trouble because this is, I just, I love that, that thing that it's like, this is not necessary, but Apple decided to do it. And it's delightful. I think maybe you could probably issue similar praise to screen sharing high performance mode. Where in your <laughs> review, you said this feature alone will get me to upgrade my server to Mac OS Sonoma. Yeah. They basically screen sharing used to be this kind of like hidden app that would launch when you were in like the sharing in the finder and you were like clicked on a, computer on your network and chose share screen was sort of how you got it. And now it's got a complete UI, you know, it lists all your recent servers and all that, but they added this high performance mode. If you're connecting, you're on an Apple Silicon Mac connecting to an Apple Silicon Mac and they're both running Sonoma, it enters this high performance mode, which, you know, is obviously going down at a deep level. If you connect to a laptop that's open sitting next to you, the laptop screen like goes off. <laughs> like it's you are taking it over wow but the result is again i've gotten used to screen sharing with my server in my house and think oh it looks pretty good and then i open this mode and it no it doesn't look pretty good it looks acceptable for what it is which is screen sharing this new mode it feels like i'm using that computer it, it really does feel like I've just, I am now, I've teleported and I'm using that computer. It is, it, it is crystal clear. This maybe is how the Vision Pro works. It's possible it's the same setup, especially since the laptop screen goes off when you that, do it. It's possible. You saying that that's the laptop screen goes off made me think that this might be what they're using for the Vision Pro to make that work. Yeah. And this is, my understanding is this is, uh, Zach's asking about like screens on the iPad. This is an Apple thing, and uh, there's no Apple screen sharing app in on the iPad, so I think not. I think this is a uh, an, a Mac only feature for now. Although they really should add it to the iPad, that would be great. Um, but it's it's very good, and um, I'm I'm anybody who's using screen sharing, and again, that's a tiny percentage of people. But I love that they gave this app some love, 
and um and it will get me to upgrade my server to sonoma because i want to connect using that uh because it looks it just looks way better also it'll do like audio and stuff and apple claims that you could like edit video using this mode and i'm my audio was a little distorted when i was using it but just like even if that is possible that's kind of, it is kind of amazing so yeah so serious upgrade to screen sharing so safari added a feature called profiles which i was yep. very excited about because mm -hmm. it would let me have uh, i would and i have set up three profiles i have a personal profile for just stuff for me I have a Relay FM profile for my podcasting work, and I have a Cortex brand mm -hmm. profile for my Cortex brand work. Part of the reason I wanted this feature is that each of these things sometimes require me to sign in to backends of services. Yes. So each of these things, so it like becomes really complicated yes. for like. Amen. And so I was really happy to have this feature. It takes a bit to set up because, like, it doesn't even seem to remember some of the, uh, like, it, it doesn't share your search history, it seems like, between them. So you got to do that. you got to re-enable some extensions. Like, it takes a little bit of time yeah. to, to set up. Um, the implementation on Sonoma, I actually think, is worse than the implementation on iOS. Because on iOS and iPadOS, I can toggle the same, like, app between each profile. Mm -hmm. But on macOS, you switch to a new window each time. Like it's right. not like a save state. So I now on my Mac have three Safari windows open all the time. And then I just mm. switch between them, which that is definitely a downside. But the upside of this feature is much higher for me. But what I would like to be able to do is just to be able to toggle between them. But it, what it makes you do is open a new window each time you want to toggle between them, which is a strange way of doing it, but that's the way that I decided to do it on the Mac, which is odd. I don't really know why it is yeah. that way. I, I like this feature too. I'm using it for YouTube, believe it or not. That's what I one. have. Yeah. I have my whole world in one particular Google account. And then everything I do on YouTube is in a different account. Mm -hmm. And I end up having to be logged into both. And, and it has really negative effects. Because, as you know, because this happens with our Google Docs for this show, um, I don't know why Google does this. I don't know why. It's so frustrating. Sometimes it just decides, oh, you've got, you're logged into two accounts. I'm going to use this other account for this, mm -hmm. for this Google Doc. It's like, no. I never want to use that account with this Google Doc, but you can't really set a default. The only real to, way to get it to work um, uh, every time is to log out of the other account. But that's the account I need for YouTube. So frustrating. Mm -hmm. So now I have a YouTube profile that is logged into that account. And I have a personal profile that is literally everything else just so that I can keep the YouTube login completely separate so it doesn't keep hijacking all my other Google yep. stuff. Um, but it works great. My only problem there is um, the UI, it, once you switch and you have a YouTube window open, it wants every other window to be a YouTube window. And I don't want that. I actually, I want it to be, and I don't think there's a, you can set a default, but that's not the same thing. I would like to be able to say all new windows open in this profile. Yeah, because th this is part I, of the tab want, group problem too. Tab yeah, group I, works like this. Exactly. 99% of the time, I want it to be in not a tab group and personal profile. Um, but it does this thing where like, if I'm in YouTube profile, it thinks everything I click on and everything I want to do is in YouTube profile. And it's like, no, I make a new window. It's in YouTube profile. I have to turn it back to personal. I don't like that. I want it to just be only go into the other profile when I tell you to, otherwise have a default profile. And there is a default, but it doesn't stick yep. across based on the state of the current window. It doesn't stick. And I, I, it drives me nuts. So, yeah. like, And it's also the thing that I want where you could switch between them you can do that if you open a blank new window. You can switch that window between the other profiles. Right. But as soon as you navigate to a web page, it doesn't let you do that anymore. And it will nope. now only ever open a new window with a different profile in it. 
it's um it turns out that it remaps the keyboard shortcuts too in the file menu so when i'm in a youtube window there is a new personal window keyboard shortcut that is option shift command zero (laughs) okay all right I mean, that's cool but what to I know, would, it's, oh, but it's but what weird. I would like, I would <laughs> like is to say, no, no, no. Command N always means personal window, it's and then give me another shortcut like, for my others. I don't it's know what default. it would be, but like Command N or Option Shift Command One. It's like they're not like that's hard for me to remember. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like they're quite different those those window shortcuts. But like for me. While I find this frustrating, it is not surprising because I've been a tab groups user and some of the way that tab groups defaults work has, has been weird. I am at least getting what I want out of this, which is I'm able to 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 move things away. And I will say as well, like especially on iOS, the fact that if I want to go from one uh, profile to another is multiple taps. I actually like that because it's adding a hurdle for me to then go to one of my work profiles while I'm on my iPhone. So it's like, mm, I like those things sometimes, like make it just a little uh-huh. bit harder for me to bit. get to the work that I maybe shouldn't be doing at that time. So, Yeah, uh, I agree. I also want to add in one thing that I know you won't use, but I am happy about, which is the predictive text stuff from iOS and macOS is also, uh, from iOS is also on macOS. So I can press the space bar to finish words and sometimes sentences, which I'm really happy about because I love that feature. And it's great here too. I'm, I, I, maybe didn't know this or missed this that they were bringing the transformer model to the mac i assume this is probably an apple silicon only feature um, but i started typing it's like oh it's there and i could press the space bar and have to type less and i love it um we are running long today so i'm going to bring in an ask upgrade question now into this segment oh instead of doing ask upgrade today so like half one and a half lasers uh, we mm-hmm. haven't actually left the details, so we're like we're like a stack in now. What? JB asks, have you tried running Electron apps like Slack or Discord as a Sonoma Safari web app? I'm looking forward to doing so in order to reduce memory usage and improve battery life on my machine, but I'm curious if it works well in practice. Um, I I don't understand how this would be better. Um, you know, web apps are web apps. <laughs> Yeah. I think I think that there's some um, misconceptions here from JB about exactly how this thing works and the resource load. Yeah, I I think it would be kind of similar. The other problem is that you're also losing features. So like Slack doesn't let you, as far as I could tell, switch between instances. <laughs> so you'd ha- just have to have like multiple windows open for each of your Slack instances. But I also don't. I don't un- think this understand why you wouldn't just download. I mean, like I know like the Electron, oh, Electron, like just download Slack. The, the only thing that I have found as a as a problem with electron apps per se is like some that i use is every update is like 250 megabytes right because you're yeah. basically re-downloading the entire thing every time like that could be annoying but yeah i i mean give it a shot i have tried it and what i found is that i hate it and so i have not <laughs> used it for an extended amount of time in order to uh, like it just doesn't work the way I use Slack or Discord. Yeah. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. And you end up in a situation where I've got a substandard Slack or Discord experience and th- running those apps don't bother me. Uh, running them in Safari or standalone Safari, that they bother me. So I'm not going to do it. So I, I can't report back and say, oh yes, but memory usage and battery life improved. I, I can't answer that question for you. If it works for you, give it a try, but I don't have an answer there. I think that they're inferior experiences and that the, the apps actually are better. Um, I did, I was impressed with the Gmail web app. You know, I used uh, Mailplane for a long time to put up sort of like an app wrapper around uh, Gmail and it did a bunch of things that the Gmail web app obviously doesn't do but I was impressed that they are using all of the sort of like app detection stuff so that Apple uh, has built in so like when you open Gmail in the new Safari you get a little thing at the top about a banner that says would you like to open this in its own app wrapper basically and it'll save it they all save to user your user folder slash applications which is funny so it's not it's not in your regular applications folder what? Um, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. this is. But, I was actually going to ask you a question because, like, yeah, the 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 way you do this is you invoke a a menu command saying add to dock, right? Add to dock. And I don't yeah. want them in my dock necessarily. Yeah. Well, it's very much like shortcuts where you add it to the dock, and what it does is it actually puts it in use your user folder slash applications. Oh, this is this um, is now on. And then you can take it out of the dock. So, okay. You can so take I've it had out of the dock. A weird thing happening where I uh-huh. created a couple of these apps just to try them out, right? And remove them from the dock, 
and then they I thought they'd disappeared. And now when I go to Google Docs, it's like, hey, do you want to open the web app? And I'm like, what are you talking about? Because I thought I deleted it. Well, obviously I haven't, but it's not in the applications folder. But no, why would I assume user folder, that it would be somewhere al- else? Along wow, with shortcuts okay. and Steam apps. Okay. That's where they all go. Uh, why they're all have in they there. done it that way? Why don't they put I it in the applications folder? I don't know. I think you can put it there, but it's not there. Anyway, the Gmail Weird. one, it's pretty nice. It's not as It's not as nice as... Um, Mailplane because Mailplane did lots of like Mac keyboard shortcuts and and things that when you're fully integrated with the Mac system you could do, but you know what? If Mailplane had died and MimeStream hadn't come, um, I would have this would have been like a moment of if Mailplane then died I would be like ah oh, I can use Gmail and it's close enough. But I I'm all in on MimeStream now so it doesn't it doesn't matter. But like I think it's cool. I'm a big fan of this idea of the single site browser. I've been for a while. I'm glad that Apple has finally embraced it because. I one of the things I hate, the thing I hate the most about like, oh, rely on this website like it's an app is it's just another window or it's just another tab in Safari. And like I'm using Safari all day. It's so easy to close a tab, close a window. And you're like, ah, but my thing just disappeared. And I kind of would prefer app style management, right? Where it's like, oh, no, Gmail is in its own little you know, quote unquote app. It lives over there. I can hide it or show it as I choose. I can command tab to it. And it's not one of my many open Safari windows. And you know, I, I'm a minimalist. I don't like many open Safari windows, but the idea that like that web app just lives in its own little space. I really like that. I've always liked that. And so for Apple to embrace it is really good. Um, but yes, look in look in uh, your user folders, applications folder to discover. Surprise! Incredible. There might be things in there. That's where they are. I had no idea. Yeah, and, and that's when you add shortcuts to the doc. It's the same thing. You can just take them right out of the doc. But now you've got a clickable like application in uh, in Finder. I want to finish uh, this conversation by uh, quoting from your from your conclusion. You say, I sort of missed the days when every Mac OS version would bring massive changes to the entire concept of the operating system, but I also kind of don't. Two decades in, stability should be a hallmark of the modern Mac OS, but Apple should never stop striving to make the experience better. That's what Mac OS Sonoma manages to accomplish. Yeah. I mean, if every update was like this one, I think I'd be pretty happy. It they're They're importing all of the um, platform features from across iOS, iPadOS, and Mac OS, they added some nice detail work to Mac features. They made sure that some of the iOS features work better or differently on the Mac. It, you know, it could it be more? Yes, but on one level, as I just as I said in that thing that you read, um, I don't need it to be more. Like I don't need it. I don't need more. I need it to be stable and I need it to be nicer over time. Um, and and Sonoma for me, that's what Sonoma is. It's nicer, and um, there are a lot of surprisingly nice little details that give me actually hope for Apple, how Apple views the Mac, like that they took the extra effort to build these features. I, I, I love that. I would also just like to say that I'm very thankful that it came out in September. Like I, I know it must be really hard to get all this stuff to match up, but I'm just happy that I'm able to take advantage of all of the cross-platform features within seven days of each other rather than a month. Like I'm sure when Mac OS has to go yeah. into October, there's a good reason for it. But I just want to note that when they are able to do them close to each other, I just think it's really nice and I'm very happy for it. Because then, because if that would have happened, you know, like I maybe would have turned on profiles on my iPhone and then it's like, well, now I can't use my browser on my Mac either. So I'm actually really happy I didn't turn that feature on, which you can turn on on your iPhone as the first place, but it's it's like buried in settings. You can send us your feedback, follow-up, and questions. We will do more Ask Upgrade next week over at UpgradeFeedback.com. You can check out Jason's reviews and all of his work over at SixColors.com and hear his podcast at TheIncomparable.com and here on Relay FM, where you'll hear my shows as well. You can check out my work at CortexBrand.com also. We're on Mastodon. Jason is at JSnell on Zeppelin.Flights. I am at iMike, I-M-Y-K-E on Mike.Social. You can find Upgrade as Upgrade at RelayFM.Social. That's where you can see video clips of the show, but also probably best served on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube, where we are at Upgrade Relay. We're also on threads. I'm iMike. Jason is JSnell. 
Thank you to our members who support us of Upgrade Plus. You can get longer, ad-free versions of this show each and every week by going to getupgradeplus.com. I think today we're going to talk about the fact that we're trying full video episodes of the show, uh, which you can find on YouTube. Thank you to our sponsors, Uni and Squarespace. But most of all, thank you for listening. We'll be back next time. Until then, say goodbye, Jason Snow. Goodbye, Mike Hurley. I, mean, I like that. You bring in the beginning and end together. I just tried to, yeah, bring it back around. <laughs> <laughs>